On behalf of the entire GSIS community, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you at IB Monthan. It is an honor for us to be your hosts over the next two days. Thank you, Stephanie, for, you, for kicking off the event and for professing with so much passion and conviction your support uh, for not just the IB Monthan, but also for the IB mission. I'm grateful to our keynote speakers and workshop facilitators for their presence here today, and I look forward to hearing from each of them over the next two days. Dr. Dr. Swati Popadvats is the president of the Podar Jumbo Kids chain of preschools and founder president of the Early Childhood Association. Ms. Lakshmi Kumar is the founder and director of the Orchid School. Ms. Sita Muthi is the director and education, director of education of the Silver Oaks International Schools. Mr. Vishwas Parshure is a director at Experiential Leadership Institute. Ms. Sri Lakshmi Reddy is the founder director at the Keystone Education Group. Ms. Rita Purna Ghosh is an erudite speaker and storyteller and the founder of Your Story Bag. I also want to recognize our session leaders with whose contribution and acumen we expect the next two days to be impactful and insightful, and I hope will elevate your penchant for lifelong learning. Thank you also to our sponsors, Shivom and the University of Huron, Life Educare, Bright Champs, School Guard, Redwood Edu Edutors, and Fuel. We appreciate your support and interest in this event, and thank you so much for being a part of IB Monthly. So I must have been about 10 years old when my dad gave me a personal digital assistant, something you don't hear very often nowadays. And I fell, with, fell in love with this thing instantly. It encouraged me to become more organized. And to this day, the Pixel 7 that I use, the address book in that device had its roots in that device. Now over the years, I upgraded to newer, newer devices with fancy features and innovations, and if you're a geek, you'll know exactly what you're talking about, like me, I love devices. I'm a geekhead, I would say. But anyway, this thing, my, my love for these devices eventually led me to a startup by the name of Palm. Best known for the Palm Pilot, which integrated for the first time a touchscreen in a handheld device. That's what they were in, that, that was their innovation back then. And it was very cutting edge technology. So Palm played a very pivotal role in the evolution of the personal digital assistant, or PDAs as they, as they were known. They revolutionized the market when they launched this device, the Palm Pilot, back in 1996. Now this device was notable, obviously, for the touchscreen and how, it, how the user interacted with the device through that touchscreen. And you'll notice there's a stylus right, right beside it. Now to input your data into this device, you use that stylus to either tap on a keyboard, well this one has a key, they eventually introduced a model which is the phone that also has a key, the keyboard built into it, but the first device was just this screen with a stylus next to it. And you had to learn their language called graffiti, which I managed to master, and that's how you interact with the device, and of course, that was a big innovation back then. Now the significant moment came when Palm combined the, the PDA with the functionalities of a phone, which is what you see over here. Leading to the creation of one of the earliest and most successful smartphones. Now this integration marked a monumental shift in mobile technology, foreseeing a, a future where, where phones were not just used for communication, but also for organizing your, your personal uh, information, your lives, and, and for entertainment. Now this integration was a visionary step influencing subsequent developments in the smartphone industry and changing the way people interacted with technology in their daily lives. Clearly, Palm's contribution was not just in hardware, but also in inspiring a whole new era of mobile computing. So like Research in Motion, which is famous for their Blackberries, why doesn't Palm exist today? Even after pioneering one of the most innovative smart, smartphones of, of time. The answer 
is disruption. Somebody took their revolutionary idea and reimagined it through a maniacal focus on one thing, simplicity. In 2007, Steve Jobs famously introduced the world to his three-in-one device, an internet browser, an iPod, and a phone, all wrapped into one. He called it the iPhone. But its most distinguishing feature is it, it did not come with one stylus, it came with five. Among the many things that were superior in its functionality, one of the most significant was that the user did not need a stylus to interact with the device. Instead, they simply used their fingers to tap, to swipe, to pinch the screen. It just seemed natural. It seemed simple. Despite the revolutionary device they had created, Palm failed to look past the stylus in order to interact with that touchscreen. Now, there are a number of stories of disruption in the contemporary history of business. From Kodak, who failed to see the potential of the digital camera, even though they invented it. Or Sun Microsystems, who dominated enterprise computing, but failed to see the potential of the internet, even though their company motto was, the computer is the network. In each case, someone found a faster, cheaper, or better way to solve problems by disrupting the successful model of the established incumbent. So it makes me wonder, what are the underlying skills, capabilities, and mindsets that can be attributed to this disruptive phenomena? What role can education play in honing these skills to build a strong foundation on which future innovation is enabled by? Now, if you look closely at what made both Palm and Apple unique, they fostered skills such as inquiry, critical thinking, creativity, risk-taking, global awareness, effective communication, technological literacy, and reflection. These skills are also reflected in the way Steve Jobs and his team at Apple reimagined and developed the iPhone, a device that has set the standard for, modern, for the modern smartphone industry. By looking beyond the stylus and looking beyond the device, Steve Jobs created a vast ecosystem that today drives more than 60% of Apple's top-line revenue that includes services. And this company is today worth $3 trillion. Learning to think differently or critical thinking is among the most essential of skills, especially in a world where machines are getting smarter with each day that passes, surpassing that of the average human. It is time to define the future of education for the next era, one in which it's not just humans who are learning, but also machines. Back in 1968, the IB initiated the future of education to programs focusing on teaching students to think critically and independently, and how to inquire with care and logic, preparing them for a rapidly evolving and increasingly global society. Likewise, I find India's new national education policy that was announced in 2020 to be a remarkable, to be remarkable in the progressive changes that it proposes. A shift towards a more holistic and multidisciplinary approach with an emphasis on critical thinking, creativity, and flexibility. It includes a reduction in the content load of the curriculum to enable more focus on essential learning. These noteworthy changes, when fully realized in our education systems, will set us apart in our breadth of skills, acumen, and a purpose that is rooted in our communities and for future generations. Now, having said that, 
There is one area that I think is not only relevant to what has brought us all together here today, but also perhaps the most important aspect that underpins the success of the NEP and the future of education. And that is teacher training and professional development. The focus on continuous professional development for teachers, including training in new, training in new pedagogies and technologies. Technological integration, promoting the use of technology for better educational outcomes, including online and digital resources. When I think about the future of education, I start by thinking about the future of work. One thing is clear. In today's rapidly evolving industries and marketplaces, they are increasingly becoming transdisciplinary, creating intersections across industries and marketplaces. By combining commerce with technology, Amazon and Etsy have carved a niche for themselves. By combining automotive and technology, Tesla, Polaris, and BYD have created a whole new segment of automotive. By combining finance and technology, Stripe, PayPal, and Block, which is Jack, uh, Jack Dorsey Square, have created a whole new vertical called FinTech. By combining healthcare and artificial intelligence and, and other technologies, including robotics, DeepMind, Intuitive Surgical, 23andMe, CRISPR, are examples of companies that are reshaping the medical industry. Netflix was a maverick company more than 20 or 30 years ago when they decided to take entertainment and put it on your, on your, mobiles, on your, mobile, on your mobile devices. They reshaped media and entertainment. And if you look at who's winning the awards today, it's companies like Netflix for their creativity and innovation. Now, they all have one thing in common. Their businesses run on technology. So as industry, government, finance, manufacturing, design, research, retail, and many other areas are becoming increasingly entrenched and enmeshed in technology, are we doing enough both to enable ourselves as teachers and administrators to maximize our understanding and the, and the effective use of technology in our lives? Can we then turn our attention to how we empower our students to more effectively leverage technology through every phase of their lives? Many of whom, by the way, are way out of us. How AI will change education largely depends on how you define education for the future. I think there are two approaches education can take with AI. Explore how AI can augment the learning and teaching process. Or second, explore how we can teach the use of AI to scale problem solving. The future of work and the future of education is a world filled with challenges, but also incredible opportunities and possibilities. Now, I've learned that when approaching problem solving, after determining the why and the what, it is natural for, for us to focus on how to solve the problem. But really, I think it should be who should so solve the problem. So who do you think owns defining the future of education? I think all of you do. Thank you all once again for being a part of IB Mountain at GSIS. Make the best of the next two days and keep on learning. Thank you.